Okay, uh, let's uh, begin uh, this uh, third of the uh, DARA e-seminar uh, series. So welcome everybody who's uh, joined us for, uh, for this time. Um, it's a real pleasure this time to welcome uh, Professor Ben Stappers uh, from the University of Manchester to deliver this uh, uh, seminar. So uh, Ben has been a real uh, stalwart supporter of the DARA project uh, over the years. He's uh, been leading the uh, unit two and three training, the, the practical training uh, in Ghana uh, for several years now. Uh, and he also has developed uh, the, an instrument, the Pulsar backend that has been installed and, uh, and commissioned on the uh, 32 meter uh, dish at Kutunze uh, in Accra in Ghana. Um, so, Today he's going to tell us about the exciting world of uh, fast radio bursts. So this is the first of these diary seminars that we've had on a, you know, from the professional astronomers about um, about one of the topics that that interests them. Um, and so uh, I'll, without any further ado, we'll we'll pass over to Ben. Uh, as before, for those who've you joined, then um, you can. Um, ask questions as you go along by putting them in the uh, Q&A window. Um, so feel free to do that. You know, if, you, if you're not sure, you, you'll remember the question by the end, then feel, feel free to type it in as we go along. But we will save all the questions asking them until the end, uh, as before. So, and, uh, and I will chair that at the time. Okay, so, um, so Ben will talk for about 40 minutes or so, and then we've, then we've got the rest of the time for, for a question and answer session. Okay, I will uh, just hand over control to Ben uh, to uh, take us underway. Hopefully you can all see me now and hear me now. Um, it's a great uh, privilege to be able to give this uh, presentation. Um, it uh, seems a little strange to be doing it from my, uh, from my house, but uh, that's the world we live in right at the moment. But it's really nice to be able to do that anyway and reach out to you all over the, all over the world. Um, so maybe I'll just check that people are actually hearing me first before I carry on. Somebody can give me a sign they're hearing me. Yes, Ben, we can hear you. Okay, great. And then I'll just start sharing my slides. Okay, great. Hopefully you can now see my slides. If I don't hear anything to the contrary, I'll, uh, I'll assume you can. Right, okay. So yeah, so what I want to talk to you today about uh, is an a uh, group of objects called fast radio bursts that are really, um, and I excuse the pun, lighting up uh, radio astronomy at the moment. Uh, and as I'll touch on during the talk, um, it's such a hot topic, things are developing on a uh, on almost a daily timescale in this field. So just to remind you um, about radio astronomy, and <clears throat> many of you will have already done uh, some of the training courses, so you'll know this very well, but I'll just uh, give you some background. If we look at the electromagnetic spectrum, uh, we can see uh, very clearly that it ranges uh, from the uh, short wavelength high energy emission uh, associated with gamma rays and x-rays that you can see here on the right hand side. Uh, and on the far left hand side is the area where we're interested in in this, uh, in this talk, and that is in the radio wavelength range. So that's where we have long wavelengths low energies and low frequencies. And so we, uh, in order to be able to do this sort of astronomy, we are very fortunate that if we, um, that here on earth, that um, we can observe these wavelengths from the ground. So basically you can see here in this graphic, uh, it shows you in the top plot the uh, atmospheric opacity. So if it's 100%, it means that the radiation doesn't reach the Earth. Uh, and you can see uh, between the range of around about uh, a few centimeters wavelength uh, all the way down to uh, a few tens of meters of wavelength, uh, the 
radio waves can reach the ground. And so that means that we can build our telescopes, uh, like the one shown in the bottom graphic, uh, uh, on the Earth, uh, which means that we can um, take advantage of the, of the relative cheapness of doing that compared to having to launch the satellites that you can see uh, for doing infrared and um, gamma ray or X-ray or ultraviolet astronomy. And so radio astronomy is predominantly done from the ground, although as some of you may know, there are also some radio telescopes that are used uh, in space uh, for doing very long baseline uh, interferometry. Some of you may be familiar with, uh, with the optical telescopes and the concept of optical telescopes. And you can see on the far right hand side here, um, an example of, uh, of an optical telescope that um, might be used by somebody uh, who was doing amateur astronomy, for example, but all the way through to these extremely large telescopes. You can see in the middle examples of the Keck telescopes, which are these 10 meter class telescopes. Uh, and the one below it shows you the, um, uh, the uh, VLT, one of the VLT uh, telescopes uh, in Chile. And so this is what you maybe are familiar with in terms of what an optical telescope might look like. Radio telescopes actually come in a diverse range of sizes and shapes. Uh, and you can see some examples here of different types of radio telescopes. In the top on the left, you can see an example of the um, Molongolo a radio telescope that's located in Australia. You can see that it's a very, very long cylinder um, and uh, that gives you a very large collecting area for a relatively inexpensive price. Um, on the left hand side, you can see the Parkes radio telescope. Uh, if you've ever seen the film, uh, The Dish, for example, uh, then you may be familiar with this telescope and its role in, um, uh, in capturing the film associated with the moon landings. Uh, on the far right hand side, you can see the second largest radio telescope on Earth. Uh, this is the Arecibo telescope and you can see how it's constructed uh, on the ground and so that uh, it doesn't uh, move the dish itself, but uh, the receiver, which is located in that little region at the top, can be moved around to, um, uh, to track sources a little bit across the sky. And those of you from Ghana or those of you who've done Unit 2-3, um, we'll recognize right in the middle here the uh, Kundunza telescope uh, just outside Accra, um, which, um, which is now fitted with a, uh, with a pulsar back end, as Melvin was already mentioning. Um, and of course, in the bottom left hand corner, we show an example of an interferometer. Um, and uh, we'll talk more about interferometers later on. Um, but these are uh, distributed dishes which are combined together. Uh, electronically to simulate a much larger dish. So what does the radio sky look like? If we look at an image of the radio sky, what might it look like? Well, here is a very beautiful image made um, during the commissioning phase of the Meerkat telescope located in the Karoo in South Africa. And here you can see uh, the colors uh, correspond to the intensity of the radio radiation that's been received. Um, and this is a view towards the galactic center. So the center of our own galaxy where the massive black hole is located. And you can see lots of beautiful structure and shapes and, uh, and contours and things. And many of these things are associated with uh, uh, things like supernova remnants, which mark the, uh, the point at which a star exploded and, and blew out its layers into the uh, surrounding medium. Um, and so it's a vibrant area um, but the question is that you could ask yourself, if I was to make uh, an image of this region of the sky tomorrow, would I expect to have seen anything vary at all? Is the radio sky variable? Do we expect that when we go back each time and look at the radio sky, do we expect to see anything that changes? And it turns out that it does. We see things like the supernova explosions that I mentioned before, we see uh, stars that flare. We see uh, all sorts of different things that vary. But the objects that vary the most rapidly in the sky are objects which I used to, well, I do still study, but was, um, um, which are radio pulsars. <clears throat> Excuse me. 
So radio pulsars are these extremely compact neutron stars. They have a radius of around about uh, 10 kilometers, and they can spin up to 700 times a second. And every time that they spin around, if you have a radio telescope which is uh, sensitive enough, you can detect a pulse of radio emission from this um, beam that you can see here in this animation. So that beam of blue that you can see there corresponds to the radio emission um, being given off by this rotating object. And the reason it gives off this radio emission is that it has an extremely strong magnetic field. And so what does that look like when we re receive it at the radio telescope? Um, what you see are these pulses of emission. So you can see that when the beam is not pointing towards us, we don't receive any radiation. But when, as soon as the beam is pointing at us, we get a burst of radio waves. And so these bursts of radio waves um, correspond to each rotation and so they look like pulses, hence the name pulsar. And the reason I'm introducing these objects to you is because um, it's, they're going to become important a little bit later on when we talk about fast radio bursts. So it was while looking for more of these objects that so people were searching for more of these radio pulses, pulsars, uh, and they were actually looking for them in the nearest by galaxies to our own, the small and large Magellanic clouds. And for those of you who are able to see the southern sky, you may be familiar with where them uh, as beautiful objects in the night sky. <clears throat> and the observations um, were made in 2001 but um, uh, Duncan Lorimer and his collaborators came up with an idea that um, a good way to find pulsars might be to search for an individual pulse. So just one of those pulses from the, that I was showing you on the previous screen, because sometimes those pulses are very bright. Um, and so you can find them uh, just by looking at a single pulse. And so what they were doing was they were searching through a data set that had been stored on disk in 2001, but then they were analyzing the data in 2006. And when they um, analyzed the data, what they found was they found an incredibly bright single burst. And so you can see this burst in the uh, plot on the right-hand side. And this is uh, from data taken with the Parkes Radio Telescope. And there's two things to notice about this is that in the plot that you can see that shows time against wavelength, uh, you can see that the burst arrives later at uh, lower frequencies or longer wavelengths. And if you correct for that delay, uh, then you get the picture you can see in the inset. So this was a bright burst and it had a sweep in frequency. And I'll explain on the next slide why that sweep in frequency is incredibly important. The other thing uh, to note is, like I said, that it was very bright, um, and which is interesting from the point of view of how far away was this particular object. So where does that frequency dependent delay in the arrival time of this burst come from? Well, you're probably all very familiar with what happens when you shine white light through a, um, uh, a prism. And you can see here in this example, um, showing you how the light of the different colors uh, is traveling at a different speed as it passes through the prism. And so that causes them to be separated, as you can see here. Something similar happens in the radio uh, due to the electrons that lie between us and the source of the radio emission. And we can see this most easily when there is a burst of radio waves. So if we have, as shown here in this animation, as time goes on, the pulse will arrive later at lower frequencies. And this is because the radio waves are interacting with electrons uh, that are um, come from ionized hydrogen located in the medium between us and the pulsar. In this case, this is an example of a pulsar. 
for any radio wave that's propagating through uh, a medium which contains uh, free electrons, as we call them, uh, will be affected in this way. And so if you want to detect the pulse, uh, as you can see in this graph, you would need to correct for this delay, okay? If, as you can see here, if I don't correct for the delay, if I just simply sum across all the frequency channels, I don't see a pulse anymore. However, if I um, add up along the line that's shown in the graph, um, then I will be able to see the pulse. So I will have two numbers from this. I will have what's called the dispersion measure. So this is the degree to which the, where, uh, the frequency delay is delayed. And that depends on the number of electrons that lie along the line of sight. And I will get the pulse. So this dispersion measure is crucial to uh, distinguishing the origin of these emission. And the reason for this is that you can imagine that if a, um, a burst happened that was here on Earth, right next to your radio telescope, then it should experience no dispersive delay because between you and the burst, or you, you being the radio telescope, and the burst, there's no uh, intervening material. There's no free electrons or very few free electrons. And so the radio waves do not experience any dispersion. So this is a way for us to distinguish between real astrophysical bursts of radio emission and uh, local, what we call radio frequency interference. Okay, and so that's a, one, the first crucial aspect. The next crucial aspect is that if we look at an a, a um, model of our own Milky Way that's shown on the left-hand side here, you can see that there are all sorts of different regions. You can see there are spiral arms, for example, and you can see uh, a region in the galactic center. In those regions, there are different num amounts of free electrons. And so if you can make a model of the distribution of the electrons in our galaxy, which is what is shown on the right-hand side by these gray lines, um, then if you count up how many electrons, which you can get from the dispersion measure, then you can effectively get the distance to that source. Okay, so it's like you're effectively able to make a map of the galaxy, and the map relies on knowing where all of the electrons are. So you can work out, oh yeah, this is where all the electrons are in the galaxy. And so this is a crucial aspect uh, of the story of fast radio bursts. And if we look at a, um, a site on view, as shown here, so here we're showing an ATOF projection of the galactic plane or the of the galaxy, uh, where zero, zero is that location that I was cho showing you before from that beautiful meerkat image where you can, is the galactic center. Um, and then we plot this as galactic latitude against gal uh, galactic longitude. And you can see that most of the electrons in our galaxy lie in the plane of the galaxy. Okay, so if you're looking through the galaxy, you'll see many, many more electrons than if we look up out of the galaxy, for example. And you can see some interesting regions here around about at minus 90 degrees galactic longitude. Um, we think that's a, uh, a, an old nearby supernova that's left a ring of electrons that you can see there. So with this, um, we can work out, and with our model, we can work out that if we find a new object, a new burst of radio emission, then we can get a pretty good idea, maybe plus or minus 20 to 30%, um, of the distance to that object, okay? And vice versa, if we look along any line of sight, we can measure uh, what we expect the dispersion measure to be. We can make a calculation. We can say, ah, if I'm looking in this direction, the maximum amount of dispersion I should see is some number. So the Lorimer burst was very interesting, but because there was just one of them, people were very skeptical as to whether, they are, whether it was real or not. There was a lot of discussion about whether it could have been from some interfering source or what it could have been. 
Uh, and that changed in 2013 when a student of mine uh, was working with data from the Parkes Radio Telescope as part of the High Time Resolution Universe Survey. Uh, and we found four more of these so-called fast radio bursts. And you could see the burst shapes on the right-hand side uh, and note that the naming convention is uh, 11, stands for the burst was from 2011, 02 is February and it was the 20th of February. Okay, so the burst was, was uh, received by the telescope, not the day that it was discovered because these bursts were all discovered in data that had been pre-recorded um, and these are the bursts. And so this meant that finally we could say there was a population of fast radio bursts. It wasn't just this one-off weird object. We now knew that they were real uh, and that they were astrophysical objects. And this got some interesting, uh, pe people got lots of interesting. Uh, it, there was lots of press around it. Newly discovered fast radio bursts might be colliding neutron stars, um, a brilliant flash than nothing, mysterious deep explosions, baffle scientists. And we're always being baffled. Um, um, but the other thing that was important, uh, I guess, is that we coined the name fast radio bursts. So that's where you now hear the use of this FRB or fast radio bursts associated with these objects. <clears throat> okay, so as I mentioned, we now had a population of these objects. Um, you'll notice one interesting thing in the object uh, on the top left, that's FRB 110220. If you look at the middle part, what you can see is the expected delay in the arrival time of the pulse as a function of frequency, showing that it's dispersion measure, so that it was dispersed and therefore we know that it came from outside of the Earth. Well, you'll also see that the profile gets broader as we go to lower frequencies. And that broadening is also associated with the material between us and the object that emitted the burst. So that's, um, uh, we call that scattering. So there are two effects due to these free electrons. There is dispersion and there is scattering. And so this is even more evidence that these objects are occurring from well outside of the Earth. Um, and um, so finally, we had some more clues as to where, what these objects were. But the big mystery about all of this is that the, fast, that the dispersion measures that we were measuring for these fast radio bursts were extremely large. They were much larger than could be explained by these objects being located in our galaxy. So this was very uh, confusing because it wasn't expected that anything could generate a bright burst of radio emission uh, that would be uh, sufficiently luminous to be able to be detected here on Earth if it wasn't just in a local galaxy or within our own galaxy. There still was some skepticism about the reality of these bursts from some people because these were all detected at the same radio telescope in Australia. And so perhaps there was something odd around about that, uh, that location. However, that all changed when the Arecibo telescope that I mentioned to you before um, made a successful detection uh, of its first fast radio bursts. Uh, and, this is, and it is called 121102. Um, and uh, it, uh, it has a dispersion measure in these strange units that I've given here of parsecs per cubic centimeter of 557. If you were very skeptical, you might say, oh, these bursts have all been detected at the same uh, frequency. They've all been detected at around about 1400 megahertz. However, that too was resolved when the, uh, the Green Bank Telescope, uh, shown on the left-hand side here, uh, also located in the United States, detected um, a fast radio burst, but it detected it now at a frequency of 800 megahertz. Uh, and uh, you can see here that it had a radio flux of around about 0.6 Janskys and the dispersion measure was 623. So what is this issue with, the, uh, with these large dispersion measures? What does it mean? So imagine that I detected a fast radio burst with a dispersion measure of something like uh, 1,000, okay? 
Now, if I'm looking out through the, the galaxy, uh, our galaxy that is, then you would expect that the maximum dispersion measure would be something around about 100 that you could measure within our galaxy. So somehow I have to explain where this extra, where these ele extra electrons that are causing the dispersion have come from. Now, once you get si outside of the galaxy, the density of these free electrons drops dramatically. There's an incredible drop in the, this. And so if you've got a very large number for the dispersion measure, it means that because the density is, is, um, is lower, the dispersion measure corresponds to a larger distance. So what we're showing here is imagine that um, the fast radio bursts occur in the centers of galaxies, not in our own galaxy, but in another galaxy, okay? And then if they're located in the center, then maybe of that 1,000 units of dispersion that I was talking about, perhaps 700 of them might be associated with the location in the center of that galaxy. However, here comes a slightly complicated bit. And for me, being a person who usually deals with objects only in our own galaxy, um, it's, uh, it's an important one to remember. And that's shown in the, in the bottom part of this graphic, where it says that the frequency uh, all, that the radiation was emitted at when we receive it at Earth is, of course, affected by the redshift, okay? And so what that means is that the frequency, if we detected it at 1.4 gigahertz on Earth uh, and say the redshift was 1, then the emitted radiation was at 2.8 gigahertz. And I showed you that the... Um, Frequency dependence of dispersion is quadratically dependent on frequency. And so if I have, if the radio emission that I received was at 2.8 gigahertz when it left the pulsar, then it's affected by the free electrons by a factor of four less than I might have expected. So I can hide a lot of electrons in the host galaxy. So if I've got the host galaxy as this DM of 100, the Milky Way has DM of 100, and I've got units of 1,000, we can work out how far away this object is by using a model, just like we have that model of the distribution of the electrons in the galaxy, um, for, uh, the, uh, for the distance. So if we have some model, how, how many electrons are in this medium, we call it the intergalactic medium. Then it suggests that this object, this galaxy, would be something like at a redshift of 0.6 or a distance of around about 2.2 billion parsecs. Okay, so remember our galaxy is approximately 50 kiloparsecs across or so um, at most. Uh, and then, so you're looking at these objects being much, much further away than the pulsars that we're familiar with in our own galaxy. If the burst actually happened out of the outskirts of the galaxy, then the objects could be even further away because more of the dispersion is happening in the intergalactic medium and it could be up to 2.8 or 3 uh, billion parsecs away. What we don't know exactly is A, two things. We don't know exactly the density of the intergalactic medium and we also don't know whether there are any other galaxies along the line of sight through which this radio emission might have passed which will also cause uh, dispersion of the emission. So these fast radio bursts we now know happen at distances of um, hundreds of megaparsecs up to gigaparsecs away. So they are very, very far away, which means as radio sources, they are incredibly bright. So if I show you uh, another distribution of the uh, electrons in our own galaxy, and I apologize, the axes are flipped compared to what I showed you before. Uh, you can see here that the circles, uh, the large circles, all correspond to the where in the sky, the known fast radio bursts, so the population has grown enormously, uh, are located. Okay, so you can see that we're seeing these bursts all over the sky, and the color coding of the little dots shows you the dispersion measure uh, is much, much larger than the dispersion measure we expect from our galaxy. So we now know of well over 100 of these fast radio bursts 
They're distributed all over the sky and they're located at very large distances. So the big questions are, where, what are these bursts? There are around about, we think, anywhere between 1,000 to 5,000 bursts of these occurring across the sky every single day. However, these bursts are very short in duration. They last just one or two or three milliseconds, typically. And so something very energetic has to be responsible for making these bursts. So the questions are, where are they coming from and what is causing them? So there are lots and lots of theories. And in fact, for quite a long time, there was more theories about what these fast radio bursts are than there were actually fast radio bursts. And you can see there's a whole range of objects that we could be considering. There are those like merging black holes. Uh, there are supernovae, which I show on the right, right hand side. There are merging neutron stars. Uh, there are blitzars, which are uh, apparently uh, neutron stars, which are collapsing to form a black hole. There are also gamma ray bursts, which you may have heard of. And um, also one of the most popular are magnetars. And we'll come back to those uh, in a little bit more detail later on. <coughs> Excuse me for a second. And of course, my favorite of all is the unknown. So what is a magnetar? A magnetar is, um, is like a pulsar, like those neutron stars that I mentioned right at the top of the talk, um, but they have exceptionally strong magnetic fields. The magnetic field strength uh, up to um, 10 to the 10 Tesla. Um, so, um, many billions of uh, times stronger than the magnetic field of the Earth, for example. And what happens is we think that on these highly magnetized neutron stars that the magnetic field lines can twist. And as these magnetic field lines twist, they overlap and they can give off um, bright gamma rays and X-rays. So uh, sometimes these objects are called soft gamma ray repeaters. And when those uh, field lines twist, uh, they can generate a burst of uh, emission, and those bursts might be associated with uh, the formation of uh, radio emission as well as the bright X-ray and gamma ray emission. So magnetars are one option, and we certainly know about magnetars um, in our own galaxy. The other option I mentioned was about uh, neutron star, neutron star mergers. And we also now know that these things exist thanks to the detections with LIGO. Um, no, let's just turn the volume off. Um, so these are detected. You know, we know that neutron star, neutron star mergers exist because the gravitational wave signature of these uh, objects has been detected by the gravitational wave detectors like LIGO and Virgo. Um, and it has long been proposed, for example, going all the way back to the 70s, that uh, in the uh, merger process, it might be possible to generate a burst of radio emission from these objects. And so that's another possibility. Um, a third possibility is that they are like the radio pulsars that we know about. Um, and one specific radio pulsar we know about called the Crab Pulsar uh, gives off occasionally giant pulses, uh, which are hundreds of times brighter than the normal pulses. But in order for this to be the explanation for, um, uh, for the fast radio bursts, the pulses have to be up to uh, 10 to the 9 times brighter. Or could it be something else, something else entirely? So, uh, excuse me one second, I'm just going to check what the time is. Okay, so we've got about... Uh, between five and 10 more minutes. So I'm just gonna quickly tell you about a couple of other important things. So up until uh, the discovery of this source that you'll remember from Arecibo called FRB 121102, um, we thought that these events were one-off. We thought that you had a burst of radio waves and you never saw anything again from these sources. And lots and lots of observing time had been spent 
looking for more radio emission from these sources, um, but no more bursts were seen. That was until this particular object, and now hundreds of bursts have been seen from FRB 12.1102. And we call it a repeater because the bursts repeat, um, but they don't show any specific uh, rotational periodicity or anything like that. And so it's still unclear whether these objects are a separate class of fast radio bursts compared to the objects um, that we were, uh, that the other objects which we've still only seen once. But the beauty of having a, uh, something that repeats is that you can go and look again with your other telescopes and hope that you catch a burst. And this was a really nice experiment where they looked with the European VLBI network and the email and telescopes, so something that the AVN will be able to do in the future. Um, and they looked and they found one of these bursts, and then they were able to make a very, very sharp image in the radio, which allowed them to localize the burst. And when they localized the burst, they were able to find uh, that it lived in this small dwarf galaxy through observations with the Hubble Space Telescope. So for the first time, we were able to prove this idea that we had that these fast radio bursts were located outside of our own galaxy in another galaxy. Um, and the, this, this was the proof that that was where they located. And because you could get the redshift of this galaxy, you could then do um, the distance estimate the other way around. You could now actually get a measure of the number of electrons in the space between us and this fast radio burst source. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and so something that's just hot off the press, literally um, from, uh, from last week, uh, well, actually, maybe even earlier this week, I'm losing track. Um, the uh, soft gamma ray repeater, remember I said soft gamma ray repeaters are like magnetars. Um, a magnetar located in our own galaxy with this name, SGR J1954, uh, uh, sorry, 1935 plus 2154, um, is, gave off a very, very, very bright radio burst. It was um, detected around about a megajansky in brightness. And it was detected by three different radio telescopes, one called STAIR-2, one called CHIME, and one called uh, one located in, at the Algonquin Radio Observatory in Canada. Uh, and these bursts, this burst was associated, uh, as shown on the far left-hand side, with a very uh, energetic X-ray flare seen by many different X-ray telescopes. I'm just showing one example here from the HXMT telescope. Uh, and so, uh, this has led to speculation and some papers that have been submitted that suggest that maybe we've now, for the first time, found the source of a fast radio burst in our own galaxy. However, it should be noted that the object, although it was one and a half megajanskis in brightness, uh, is still about 40 times fainter than the faintest fast radio burst we've seen so far. So maybe they are associated with each other that this is uh, breaking news. So why else are these objects interesting? Well, it turns out that a bit like uh, walking into a darkened room and turning on a torch and suddenly being able to find out what's in this room, you can use fast radio bursts as a probe of the medium between us and the galaxies in which they live. So as I already mentioned, this intergalactic medium is um, is really very interesting because um, must, much of the matter in the universe, not just the dark energy and the dark matter, but even if we look at the atoms, so around about 4.6% of the universe is made up of atoms, of that 4.6%, at least a third is thought to be missing, okay? And what that means is that we just don't know where it is. And speculation is that it lives in the regions between the galaxies, okay? So if you can measure the dispersion of your fast radio burst, and you can get an independent distance measurement to that galaxy, like you measure the redshift of the galaxy, then you can turn the problem around and you can say, ah, this means there are that many electrons in the, um, in the intergalactic medium. And when you know how many electrons there are, if you do some calculations, you can make an estimate of how many atoms there are 
and therefore whether the missing matter, the missing, sorry, atoms or baryons in the universe are located in the intergalactic medium. And so again, very hot off the press, just yesterday, and I think it's out in, in the nature today, uh, the group in Australia, uh, who using the ASCAP telescope, uh, have localized a handful of fast radio bursts, and they've used them to try and work out what fraction of the, <clears throat> excuse me, energy density um, of the universe is located in baryons. And what you can see is that they've come up with this number here, which is called omega baryon, and they get a number of around about 5.1%. So you'll remember from the previous slide, uh, we said 4.6% uh, of atoms. And so they, um, they claim that they have found the missing baryons. There is a relatively large error on that number, but um, this is really very, very promising in indicator that these fast radio bursts are telling us where the missing baryons are. And in the future, we can hopefully um, actually make a real map of the distribution of these baryons um, throughout the universe using fast radio bursts. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> uh, as you can imagine, these fast radio bursts are very, very interesting and lots and lots of telescopes around the world are now looking for them. Um, I have my own project, which is called Meertrap, uh, which is using the Meerkat telescope to try and find fast radio bursts. Uh, and uh, we've been running um, for a few weeks, a few months now. Um, we're not running at full capacity yet, um, but, uh, but things are looking really, really promising uh, for us to be able to find fast radio bursts. And one of the beautiful things about our project is that we also have the ability to localize the fast radio bursts without them needing to repeat. So something that the ASCAP telescope is also able to do. To do. Um, now, so why is this localization very important? This is the last point I want to touch on. You want to be able to locate very accurately where these bursts are. And to give you an idea of this, this graphic shows you uh, the size of the Meerkat beam as seen by one of the small 14-meter uh, telescopes. You can also see, for example, here also the Parkes radio telescope. For a contrast, the full moon is shown here. And in the center, we show the Ult Hubble Ultra Deep Field, one of the deepest optical images ever taken of the sky. Let's zoom in on that Hubble Ultra Deep Field. Every single one of the th objects that you can see in that image are galaxies. So if I knew that a fast radio burst had occurred and I only knew where it was in the sky with an accuracy of uh, two arc minutes, say, I would not know which of these galaxies it should be associated with. So I need much more accurate localization. I need to be able to say, is it in that galaxy? <clears throat> and so I need to get down to at least a few arc second localization precision. And ideally, I want to get down to one arc second so I can tell you where in the galaxy the burst happened. And that's something that we can do with interferometers if we are able to capture the right type of data. So telescopes like ASCAP, the VLA, and Meerkat are very powerful for this localization if the source isn't repeating. If it's a repeater, then you can also try and use VLBI techniques. And of course, in the future, uh, we've got the square kilometer array coming. Um, it will give us the, uh, the sensitivity and the baselines combined with telescopes in, uh, in throughout Africa to be able to do these very accurate localizations of the bursts that are the furthest away. <clears throat> okay, so that's, um, that's where I'll stop. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you, Ben. Um, I'll now just uh, ask Melvin to uh, take over at this point. If you could please pass Melvin the host. Oh, yeah, here. Or, or maybe we can keep uh, Ben as the host anyway, because maybe he can. Can you hear me now, Trish? Yes, yes, that's fine. I think I can get yeah, everybody's on there. Yes, that's fine. Yeah. Thank you. Let's, because ben, ben might want to show slides to answer some of the questions. Uh, although I may need the host in order to unmute people, but let me see how it goes. Um, okay, well, yeah, first of all, Thanks, Ben, very much. That's a 
fascinating and uh, super up to the minute uh, <laughs> uh, story on the on these exciting uh, objects and I hope everyone appreciated that and 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 also obviously showing the role of um, African radio astronomy coming up in that with uh, obviously the SKA and Meerkat uh, but also you know the idea of the the AVN and of course um, you know presumably also the single dish uh, receiver and back end on the Ghana dish could in principle uh, join in with some of these FRB efforts, I guess. But, uh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so yeah. we should have mentioned that. Yeah. So, um, you know, there is a big role for uh, the emerging African radio astronomy uh, community to get involved in this uh, exciting field. Okay. So, so far we've got uh, one question in the Q&A box. Again, the rest of the audience, then, uh, you know, please, please feel free now to to type a question in the in the Q and A session, uh, in the Q and A box, uh, so that you let me know that uh, you're you're interested. Um, I will try and so we got one question from Patrick from Kenya. Um, I will try and let you ask your question, Patrick. I think you should be unmuted now. Do you want to go for that? Mm. So it's Patrick. Uh, Agutu. Patrick, do you want to ask your question? I think you're unmuted. I'll just check. If not, I'll ask it for you. Uh, I don't... Okay, just let me ask it for you. Um, so Patrick wanted you to shade a bit, shade a bit more light on the GBT eleven oh five twenty three. That probably means more to you, Ben, than it does to me. Um, so I guess that was the one of the early ones that you talked about. I think. Uh, yes, I, I'm not sure what, what what more light you'd like to know, but uh, just to to say to confirm that yeah. So this uh, this burst was actually discovered um, uh, in data that had been recorded. Uh, for a project, I think it was to look for baryonic acoustic oscillations actually um, uh, using the GBT. Um, and so this group uh, realized that they had some very uh, high time resolution data, very raw data that they'd taken from the telescope. And so they, uh, they went through and they analyzed it. <clears throat> and um, what they found was this burst. You can see the characteristic sweep in the slide here uh, showing the, um, the dispersion delay um, and they were seeing it across the 700 to 900 megahertz. Uh, one of the interesting things you can see in the inset is that they show that the um, emission is not constant across all frequencies. It does vary in strength as a function of frequency. And this is a characteristic we've now noticed in these fast radio bursts. They aren't always what we'd call broadband. Um, so they don't always emit across the entire electromagnetic, uh, part of the electromagnetic spectrum that we're observing. Uh, sometimes they can be actually really very narrow band, which is very counterintuitive for uh, for somebody trying to um, who comes from pulsar astronomy. So I hope that answered the the question. <clears throat> yeah, sorry, I'm still working out how to try and unmute people. Um, I mean, just to follow up myself on this one, I I noticed in the in the little time sequence there in the in the inset, you know, it's it's kind of quite lumpy and bumpy, if you know what I mean. Um, yeah. So the the burst itself is there's a lot of I don't know what you want to call it modulation noise on it is that the case Ben? Yeah I think we think so I mean we think uh, so some of you may be familiar with the t concept of uh, scintillation uh, so sources that uh, travel through the interstellar medium um, as well as being dispersed and scattered uh, they are also scintillated which means that sometimes the radio waves are focused uh, or they're defocused, so you'll see uh, at certain wavelengths, if you happen to be at the point where they are focused, you'll see an increase in the brightness. Uh, we call that lensing, or sometimes called lensing, but uh, scintillation. Um, but we actually don't expect there to be very much scintillation because these objects are very far away. Um, so it's, I think it's pretty clear that for at least some of the fast radio bursts, there's very strong modulation in the, uh, in the brightness as a function of frequency and some uh, structure in the arrival time of the radio waves as a function of frequency, which is not due to dispersion. 
Okay, good. Um, okay, I think the next one to appear on my screen was from uh, Divya, who's uh, in Mauritius and actually, I think, studying the uh, variable radio sources um, with some Meerkat data, in fact. Um, so oh, yes, I know. Yes. Yeah. Divya, do you want to... Do you want to see if you can unmute yourself and ask your question? Because I can't see how to give anybody permission. To. Yeah, Melvin, I think it's actually only the host that can unmute people. Ah, so maybe I'll do um, take the host. Yeah. I'll let me re regain host control a sec then. Oh, no. Sorry for this. Well, I could always, I, I think I've got, I've got that here. I could yeah, try. Yeah, but it's probably better that Ben does it, and then Ben can still share his slides. Yeah, so Ben, you, uh, if you can. Okay. Hopefully, you can Divya. see it now. Divya, can we hear yeah. you? Uh, thank you, Professor Ben, for your presentation. Um, uh, and we know that only a few uh, fast radio bursts have been observed to repeat, and there is no clear evidence favoring a specific progenitor model. So do you think that there are two different FRB mechanisms, one for repeaters and one for non-repeaters? Yeah, I think that's a possibility, definitely. I think one of the things um, that is very interesting, well, there's a few things around this. So one thing is, is that um, the ASCAP telescope that I mentioned is very, very good at finding fast radio bursts because it sees a wide area of sky. Uh, at once, but it's not very, sen well, it is sensitive, but it's not super sensitive, so it doesn't go very deep. Um, so it's finding uh, fast radio bursts. And then what they found is that if they go to a more sensitive telescope, which is something that um, my postdoc actually predicted in a paper, uh, and look at these objects, in the, they find repeating when they look at with a more sen sensitive telescope. So that's one aspect of that. So we don't know, not, that hasn't happened for all of the fast radio bursts here. But we do know, for example, the Lorimer burst, sorry, the Lorimer burst, the very first one that was found, um, which we still call the Lorimer burst. Um, they spent more than 200 hours of telescope time trying to detect another burst from that source and, and didn't see anything. And you can imagine it's very hard to convince a time allocation committee to give you time on a telescope to see nothing. Um, <clears throat> so that's quite difficult. So there's a big question about whether all of the repeats, uh, all of the sources repeat or not. Um, I heard a number the other day from the Chime people and the Chime people have more than 700 fast radio bursts. They've not published them, um, but they have more than 700 apparently. Um, um, and I can't tell you the number because I don't know whether I'm allowed to tell you the number, but it seems pretty interesting in terms of the number of repeaters that they've seen. Uh, so I think maybe, maybe there are two different mechanisms. Maybe there are. Time, we, we, more, more to be done, I think, in this. But it could be, it, for me personally, I think it would be more interesting if there was more than one mechanism. Yes. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Divya. Uh, next question is from uh, Dennis Salungwe. If you can unmute uh, Dennis Salungwe, Ben. Uh, I think ben, there was one from Benedicta here first. Yeah, I've got oh, Dennis. Oh, they're, not in time time order. Line. oh they're not in time law, though. Oh, weird. Well, okay. I'm not quite sure. What <laughs> yeah, no, no, you're right. Sorry. Let me uh, just uh, unmute Dennis. <clears throat> Hi, Dennis. Okay, for some reason I can't unmute him. Uh, do you want to try again? I, there's an answer live thing button that I can press here. But, mm. Yeah, he doesn't have that for himself. Oh, okay. I'll ask it for him then. Um, <clears throat> so Dennis is asking that you mentioned that uh, there were, might be around 1,000 to 5,000 FRBs occurring every day. Mm -hmm. So what makes you believe we have this large number and, and how many are we actually detecting? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great question. So uh, I didn't have time to explain this um, in enough detail, but basically, um, as you may know, a radio telescope sees a relatively small part of the sky at any one time. Okay, so um, say you take a telescope like, uh, like the Kuntunza telescope, for example, right? It has a 32 meter dish. Um, if you were observing uh, at a wavelength of around about uh, 20 centimeters, 
uh, then it's probably, you know, the field of view of that telescope is just a few tens of square arc minutes. And so that's a small fraction of the sky. So despite the fact that there's 5,000 uh, across the sky, remember that there are 40,000 square degrees across the sky. And so you have to actually be quite lucky to see one of these fast radio bursts. And one of the reasons why the CHIME telescope is doing a great job of finding lots of these fast radio bursts is that they see, simultaneously, they see 200 square degrees of the sky. Um, and so they are finding of the order of three or four a day, I think. Yeah, it's, an, it's amazing progress in such a short time, really, with these specific instruments. Great. Um, so next up, Benedicto. Uh, you want to unmute Benedicto? I think she's at the top, so that you can ask, she can ask a question. Hopefully. Uh, apparently, I no longer have the ability to unmute. Something changed. Yeah. Something changed. Okay. Let me. It uh, says the Dara project is going to answer this question live for some reason underneath Benedicto now. Well, that's the button I pressed. So yeah, no, maybe uh, does that mean that, that mean it thinks I'm going to answer it? Okay. Yes. Oh, that's weird. Okay. Um, hmm. Well, I can. I, I've read the question, so I can answer it. So the question was: Hi, Ben. Please, I would like to know the effects of Faraday rotation on the propagation of the fast radio bursts, if there are any. Yeah, this is a really good question as well. So um, at the moment, the picture is very mixed for Faraday rotation. Uh, just in case people don't know what Faraday rotation is, let me quickly explain it. So as well as um, the free electrons in the medium between us and the, the source affecting the radio waves, the polarized radio waves are affected by the presence of the free electrons and the parallel magnetic field. And what it does is it causes a rotation of the plane of polarization uh, as a function of wavelength. And uh, so you can measure this, it's called the Faraday rotation, and it tells you something about the magnetic field uh, along the line of sight. Um, for, the, for the majority of the fast radio bursts so far that have been published, the rotation measures are small and are pretty much consistent with being only due to our galaxy. The contrast to that is the fast radio burst 121102, the one I mentioned from Arecibo, which has a, a rotation measure, and I'm trying to remember the exact number, but it's at least a few hundred thousand. Um, and so there's only one object in our galaxy that we know about with that, sort of far, with that sort of rotation measure, and it is located right next to Sagittarius A star. Um, the other thing about that, ob about FRB 121102, is that the rotation measure is changing. And so that means that it's located in a very dynamic environment where the electron um, and, uh, and the magnetic field strength are changing or the object is moving rapidly. Okay, should I go? I think, yeah, you, you just take control there, Ben, and keep going. Okay. So this is uh, Anthony. Uh, now let me try and let you speak. Ah, yes, go ahead, Anthony. If you would like to. You should be able to speak, I've unmuted you. Okay, unfortunately, I can't hear you. Oh, yes, go ahead. Am I audible now? Yeah, go ahead, Anthony. Okay, so I wanted to ask, uh, first of all, thank you very much. Oh, this is a very informative discussion. And I also wanted to ask, are there any current results of the baryon lepton counting using FRDs? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. I, I don't think that, the numbers that we have at the moment um, are sufficient to be able to uh, make that distinction. Uh, I think the simulations show that we probably need a, a few hundred well localized fast radio bursts, so those where we also know the redshifts, before we'll be able to do more sophisticated analysis of the uh, intergalactic medium and the number of baryons. So yeah, it's something that people want to do, um, but we, uh, we don't know if we can do it yet. 
We need many more for that. Okay, thank you. Uh, so the next uh, person in the list for me is um, Simon N. And let me just find you in the long list. Okay. Okay, Simon, you should be able to speak, hopefully. Hello. So first of all, thank you for the, for the interesting talk. Uh, I, I'm interested in the, in the electron density model that, uh, that you said. So for a given line of sight between the source and the telescope, do we assume that the distribution of the electrons is uniform? It's a very good question. Yeah, at the moment, uh, the models are indeed assuming that they are uniform. Um, and so uh, I, in that little graphic that I showed you, uh, we also need to consider that, um, in fact, one of the ASCAP fast radio bursts, they know for a fact that the radio waves pass through a galaxy that's in front of the galaxy where it lives. And they actually wrote a really nice paper where they analyzed the, um, the, um, the material in that galaxy just from one sight line. Um, but yeah, it's expected that the intergalactic medium is not uniform. Um, but the assumption is that over these large distances, uh, you can, um, the, the, the fluctuations will vary, will, sorry, will um, average out. And so that's why they're able to do the analysis that they've done. Um, however, as they point out in their paper, uh, and as we've always wanted to do, hopefully we can make a map of the distribution and then we can learn whether there are regions of higher and lower density uh, in the intergalactic medium. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. I think the next question, uh, Jones uh, Chalufa from Zambia wanted me to ask it for him. So okay. um, uh, again, a very insightful question, I think. So uh, could there be any evolutionary links between the giant pulse emission from the crab pulsar and, uh, and the repeating FRB such as uh, FRB 12.1102? Yeah, nice question. Really good question as well. Um, so the magnetar model for fast radio bursts, um, and we still don't know whether that is the model for all fast radio bursts, but let's just consider that one for now, suggests that the fast radio bursts are young. Uh, sorry, the magnetars are young. So they, they are actually probably a few hundred years old at, at the oldest. Um, and so the crab pulsar is around about a thousand years old, and, but it has a much weaker magnetic field strength. Um, so it could be, it could be um, that there is some relationship, but then we need to explain why there's a very different magnetic field strength for the crab pulsar compared to the magnetons. So. Okay, very good. Uh, next up is uh, Emily Mueni. Okay, uh, Emily, you should be able to ask your question if you'd like. For some reason, I can't unmute you. Oh, yes, now you're good. Now you're good. Go ahead. Okay, I'm not sure if you're speaking, but you, you are unmuted. Um, but I can't hear you. So maybe I'll just read your question if that's okay. Um, so Emily has asked, for a repeating FRB, is there variation in brightness for every observation? Yeah, that's a very good question too. Um, indeed, I think we do see a, 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 um, a distribution in brightness um, in the repeating FRB pulses. Um, so certainly uh, it looks like the energy distribution is probably something like a power law distribution. So um, the brightest bursts are less frequent. Um, so that's quite similar actually to, the, to what we see for the giant pulses from pulsars as well. Uh, so it could be. Um, so yeah, there's definitely a distinct variation. Okay, and uh, the last one there at the moment. Oh no, there's a few more, but oh, well, maybe there's a couple from Dennis, I think. So Dennis yep. Kayan. Okay, let me see if I can let Dennis speak. 
Okay, you should be unmuted, Dennis, hopefully. Yep, oops. Try unmuting yourself again, sorry. Yep, good. Okay, is there a way you can tell the probable cause of an FRB using different information from the same signal? Like maybe the duration of occurrence? And then the, the next question is, how best can we combine LIGO data and radio telescopes data from the same source? Yeah, two great questions. Um, the first question about the duration is, um, is a good one. The, the short duration is, at the, we've, well, it, the short duration means that um, the object that's emitting the radio waves must be very energetic. So the emission has to be coherent, uh, what we call coherent radio emission. So coherent is a bit like a laser where um, in a laser, you know, you have all the radiation is in phase. Similarly, with the bright radio emission like this, we think that there must be some sort of um, uh, coherence to the emission, which means that, uh, that that's associated with the short duration. The short duration also tells you something interesting because if the radio emission is coherent, then um, the things that are doing the emitting must be uh, what we say causally connected. What I mean by that is that they can't be further away than the duration multiplied by the speed of light. So if you take a duration of one millisecond, you multiply it by the speed of light, that gives you an idea of the size of the region that's doing the emission, emitting. And then that already gives you uh, some indication that it's a very small source. Um, however, there is one fly uh, in that ointment or some, some, something that might suggest that, that argument is not fully correct. And that is if the emission is beamed. So if for some reason the radiation is focused in a certain direction, uh, then um, that might mean that it's not uh, quite as small as we think it is. So yes, indeed, the durations can tell us something. Uh, in terms of combining LIGO data and radio telescope data, um, yeah, so that the, the, the problem there is that the gravitational wave detectors have pretty poor localization. Okay, and so their angular, the part of the sky that they can tell you where an object, uh, where an, uh, uh, something happened, is quite small. However, with a telescope perhaps like CHIME, which as I mentioned is seeing 200 square degrees of sky um, at any one time. Um, so what's that? That's about 1 20th of the, of the sky. Um, you know, once LIGO and Virgo start detecting um, tens of events, uh, which the design sensitivity of those uh, telescopes is, is suggesting that they will be able to do that within about a year or two from now, uh, then there's a possibility that something like a wide field telescope like CHIME will get lucky um, and detect something. Um, at, I would have said to you a few weeks ago that the probability is quite low because the horizon for LIGO uh, and Virgo to detecting um, gravitational wave events is I think it's around about 100 megaparsecs, if I remember rightly. I may have that number slightly wrong. Um, but, uh, and as I mentioned, the vast majority of the fast radio bursts are coming from a few hundred to a few thousand megaparsecs away. Um, and so the volume is quite small. However, um, because uh, we now think that maybe we've detected a fast radio burst in our own galaxy, um, then maybe there is still the opportunity for something to happen simultaneously. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Yes, thanks, Dennis. Um, can I just follow up on this? Because I was, I was puzzling during the talk about, um, you know, the potential for some of these sources to originate in the galaxy. A lot of the potential sources you've talked about, you know, are basically stellar sources like magnetars and that kind of thing. But you said the one that was in the galaxy was a lot, you know, a lot fainter. Do the statistics kind of add up in the sense at the moment? Um, you know, these are clearly rare events anyway. So 
Yeah, so... Uh, the, what's the chance of a normal FRB happening in our galaxy, which would be, you know, millions of Janskis, presumably. I mean, it would be stupidly bright. Huh? Yeah, so, so the telescope... I don't, can't remember if I had a chance to mention the telescope it's called STAIR-2. So that was a project set up by um, uh, actually a PhD student, Chris Kochanek and Sri Kulkarni. Um, and basically their modus operandi was maybe, maybe we'll be lucky and there'll be a galactic FRB. Um, so they have very, they're very small telescopes. They have a very wide field of view and they put three of them distributed across the United States. Um, and their, their numbers were horrendous. You know, the, the, the likelihood of detecting one was so very, very low, but they thought it was so cheap to make this experiment, they would give it a go anyway. Um, and of course they got lucky, uh, with, with this FRB. Um, but their, yeah, their predicted rates were, were incredibly low and, it, and it's still the case. I mean, if, if we have an FRB, a proper FRB go off in our own galaxy, then, then the numbers are very, very uh, wrong <laughs> in that sense. I mean, I think it's, a, I can't remember, it's like one per galaxy per mega year or something. Right. So, yeah. So, in a sense, they are consistent, obviously. At the moment. Uh, yeah, a factor of 40. Yeah, it just depends whether the SGR burst that was detected is part of some distribution. This is related to the questions that were asked earlier about the equivalent brightness, whether it corresponds to some distribution of fast radio bursts. Um, but if there are more frequent weak bursts like that one, uh, then certainly the local volume, it might, might explain why more are being seen locally. <clears throat> uh, a question from an anonymous attendee. I'll leave that till the end, I think. Um, not sure how that works. Um, but Albert Forson has got a, a question there. If, yep. If Let me that one next, if you can unmute Albert. I did. Un I've allowed Albert to mute uh, to talk. So if Albert unmute yourself, then you should be able to speak. you wish okay uh, I, I'll um, I'll answer I'll ask the question and answer the question there uh, so Albert has asked how many FRBs need to be localized to model the matter in the intergalactic medium uh, that's a that's a very good question it's very hard to know um, uh, because of course the volume uh, is enormous um, so simulations have been done that suggest that um, you need a few thousands of FRBs to be able to do this um, and they have to be all well localized although there are some people who are arguing you can do it statistically without knowing uh, where they all are exactly um, there's another really cool thing that you can do uh, which um, uh, is you can try and measure what's called the epoch of helium reionization. Uh, so this is an epoch in the evolution of the, of the universe. Uh, you probably have heard about the epoch of reionization, which is usually the hydrogen reionization, where helium also had to reionize. Um, and it's unclear whether that happened at the same time as hydrogen or later. Uh, and it turns out that if you can get a sample of around about three to 5,000 uh, fast radio bursts out to redshifts of four, <laughs> um, then you can uh, you can distinguish when helium reionization happened in the universe. Uh, so, so there's some pretty cool things you can do. <clears throat> okay, I think just to finish up, we'll make this the last. Ooh, hold on, we've got one more question. Uh, how fast is fast? That's a good yeah. question. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So far, how fast is fast? So the fastest we know about so far. Um, have a duration of around about a millisecond. Um, so yeah, so that's that's how fast. So so they last just one millisecond, one one thousandth of a second. Yeah, so this is why it's great that the same equipment that you use for the millisecond pulsars is is good for these things, right? Yep, exactly. Um, so I think here now to finally finish up, then uh, the anonymous attendee was asking about the 
basically coming back to the mechanism and the causes, which of course is the is the million dollar question anyway, I think, but maybe just as a as a way to summarize, maybe, you know, just going through the different potential types of uh, source and what 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 maybe looking forward to what we're finally gonna need to work out what this, the actual nature of the source is. Yeah, okay. Well I think that's yeah that's that's good. I mean uh, so Certainly for things like uh, the, um, the repeaters, the strong evidence seems to be now that they're probably associated with magnetars, so highly magnetized neutron stars, and potentially highly magnetized youngish neutron stars. Um, <clears throat> for the non-repeaters, um, the question is, is whether they are, uh, let's assume for now that there are really objects that don't repeat ever then it was assumed that these were corresponded to what are called cataclysmic events, so events which destroyed the object which generated the radio emission. So that's why we had things like supernovae, hypernovae, gamma ray bursts, um, neutron star, neutron star mergers, black hole, black hole mergers, a neutron star, black hole merger, and what was the other one that I had that I forgot? To Oh, the blitz are the collapse of a neutron star to a black hole. All of those models mean that one object is either transformed into another or it's been completely destroyed. Um, the, if you talk to the theoreticians about this, they say it's almost impossible to know which model without detecting these things at other wavelengths. So at the moment, fast radio bursts have only been seen in the radio, except of course this magnetar, okay? So let's just ignore that magnetar for now. But any of the ones outside of our galaxy have not been seen at other wavelengths. And although the radio emission corresponds to something very bright, um, it's, it's actually, because as I showed you right at the start, radio waves are low energy. Um, they argue, they say, where's the rest of the energy? Um, the, um, uh, the radio emission is just the tail, where's the dog? And so they say, unless you get a, you know, they will really want to see your detection in gamma rays or x-rays or the optical in order to be able to say for sure, okay, it's like this or it's like that. So that's one of the crucial things you'd need in order to be able to make a distinction. So that's why we have this project where we've got a simultaneous observations with the optical telescope, um, piggybacking on our observations with the Meerkat telescope. Uh, and so in the hope that there might be a flash of optical light uh, at the same time as a fast radio burst. And then you'll, um, then you'll, that will give us more information. Great. And I guess as the whole gravitational wave field advances and they add more detectors and the localization gets better than the chances of eventually localizing a gravitational wave source with an FRB would also increase. So, yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. And I mean, if you can wait until 2030, whatever it is, then for E Lisa will be, or Lisa, sorry, um, will be, uh, will be remarkable for this sort of thing. Yeah. Okay. Um, so great. That's a fantastic set of, uh, questions. Um, so I'd certainly love, I'll, uh, I'm going to hand back, I'm going to make uh, Trish the host in a second, just um, she's suggesting unmuting all so that we can allow people to clap. Um, <laughs> if I knew how to unmute, oh, uh, I can see a mute all, but I, I'm not sure I can do an unmute all. Um, but let me just, let me just, uh, for myself, uh, thank Ben uh, once again, on behalf of everybody for the fantastic talk and uh, really, you know, very adeptly answering all those questions. And uh, I'd really like to thank the audience. I thought the standard of questions was, was excellent, Ben. I'm sure you'd agree. Um, but, uh, you know, that, that really showed that you've all been, uh, you know, reading around and, and, and uh, really knowing your stuff here. So that, that, was, uh, that was excellent. So um, let me... Uh, Make Trish the host. Um, I think, to be honest, Melvin, um, with no worries there, I've just got a few few things that I'd like to say. Yep. Okay. So uh, yes, so um, yes, thank you very much, Ben, for your time and a great talk. And uh, it's great to see so many participants join us. That's fantastic. Um, 
I'd just like to um, confirm that I will be sending out a feedback questionnaire because feedback is important. We will continue to improve these e seminars. Uh, the link will be sent out in an email, so please, please complete that. Uh, that'd be super. Uh, we have some upcoming seminars um, planned. We have one based on business development advice that will be taking place on the 10th of June and registrations are now open for that. So please go to our website uh, to register for that event. We will continue to try and host around two e-seminars a month. If you do have any suggestions, you please uh, put those suggestions in the feedback form and we'll endeavor to, to, to host such e-seminars that, that people would like. To confirm, we do record all of the e-seminars. Uh, they will be made available on our YouTube channel, so please subscribe. That's great. Um, so we're all becoming famous. Uh, <laughs> if you need a link to that channel, please send me an email and I will send that through to you. That is everything on my list. So once again, thank you very much, Ben. I'll put a little clap there for everybody. Um, and I'll pass back to Melvin to, to finally close the, the seminar. Yeah, well, thanks everyone. I thought that was another uh, very successful virtual seminar again in, the, in these difficult times. Uh, thanks, Ben, for doing it from your house. Um, and um, as I say, we're, you know, we're lining up several more uh, talks coming up as what, you know, we've got all the full range of aspects of the whole DARA project. So, so we've got the business opportunities coming up from Steve Jones. We'll have one on sort of amateur radio coming up from Rod Hine. Um, and we'll be, we're already lining up several other speakers uh, to, to come on board as well. So we've got a, an exciting series over the next few months and uh, I hope you'll keep joining and, uh, and spreading the word to your, you know, the other, the rest of the Dara family to, to join in. So thanks very much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.